Oh man, I I did every mistake every service member makes, right? I did the the tattoos, the booze, the cars, the Harley, the guns, the women, the um, you know, I had no money. Um, seven seven and a half years in, and uh, someone handed me rich dad poor dad, and it just kind of the light bulb went off. I was like, oh, this whole money thing doesn't have to be that hard. it we are 15 episodes deep man this has been a fun ride and today i'm excited to introduce david Perey, a marine vet who went from house hacking a duplex to owning over a hundred rental units within just five years david now leads a thriving community of military millionaires sharing his insights on building wealth through real estate david brother welcome to the show yeah, man, I appreciate you having me. This is gonna be a good time. Yes, man, dude, you are making a lot of noise out there. I've been, I've been watching you. You're out there doing the podcast circuit. You've been making your rounds, definitely. <laughs> I'm trying to do something. That's for sure. As uh, you know, as an army vet myself, I love, I really do love seeing active duty members and vets excelling in real estate. It's like, it's crazy because there's not a lot of us, but the ones that are doing it are doing it really big. Um, yeah. and we, you know, we really do have an advantage that unfortunately most active duty and veterans don't really fully understand. I agree. I know when I was in, I like had no idea that I could even use a VA loan. I thought that <laughs> that was something for, Hey, once I get out, then that's something I can use. I didn't realize I could actually use it while I was in. And yeah. now with like, cause I got out in the early two thousands, so there was no bigger pockets. There weren't all these um, outlets that there are now, right? The information just wasn't yeah. there. So like, I had no clue that I could actually buy like a fourplex or something. Um, <laughs> and then when I got out and I used my VA loan to buy a single family home, I still didn't have any clue that I could actually buy like a duplex, triplex, fourplex. Um, and I've even heard your story where you, I, I don't even think, have you used your VA loan yet? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, that's what I thought. No. So talk to me about that. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I know. Everybody's like, what? You're the guy who talks about it. I'm like, well, I'm passionate about it because I got screwed a bunch. Um, my first, the first time I went to use it, you know, I, I luckily I found bigger pockets. So I knew about the duplex, triplex, fourplex thing. And I was like, I'm going to buy a duplex. And, uh, the, I went to a, a VA lender that I heard on a radio ad who, it was like bank of little rock mortgage. I'll call them out. They, you know, were advertising here in Springfield, Missouri, that they specialize in the VA loan. And I went to talk to the guy and he was like, Hmm, you can only use the VA loan once. You don't want to waste it on that house. Cause it was only like 80 grand and he was wrong. You know, obviously I could have yeah. used it a whole bunch more, especially for an $80,000 duplex. Are you kidding me? And, uh, so he talked me into a different loan, FHA, which isn't the end of the world, but cost me probably 10 grand over the life of that loan and PMI. And um, I then went to Hawaii and I was priced out there because I didn't understand that you could put 25% down on the additional little bit. So I didn't buy there. When I moved to San Diego, I just happened to get there like six months before they removed the limit on how much you could buy with your first house. And so I couldn't buy, I couldn't afford anything but a single family. And I didn't. I didn't want to own a single family in San Diego. So I, you know, I kept rocking and rolling. Um, and then like six months later, I was already in a lease and they, they removed that. And I was like, damn, I wish I'd, wish I'd known that I would have bought one, you know, here. Um, and then when I moved to Springfield, I got told, well, you don't have a W2, you don't qualify for mortgages right now. And so this year may be the first time that I'm, you know, finally like qualified to, you know, not be unbankable and I could actually buy a house. So I'm actually, I'm either going to refi the one that I'm currently standing in into a VA loan or I'll, I'll build one with the VA. You'll build it. Yeah. 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 There's just, it's just so much misinformation. You know, again, you mentioned you talked to the lender 
they, they, half of them don't know what they're talking about, right? And, and that's the big problem. Unfortunately, my VA loan is tied up in this big old house right now, and there's no way I'm going to uh, refinance out of it because uh, the rates oh, right now are rate. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I love how you're, you're spreading the word and educating people. Um, so tell me a little bit about your journey. Like, first off, I have to ask, as an Army vet, why didn't you want to be all you could be and uh, join the army? Why did you settle for the Marines? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Your, your answer actually has a funnier answer than if any other branch had, had asked me because I, I did talk to every recruiter. I talked to every branch, not the Coast Guard because they didn't have a recruiter in Arkansas. And I don't even know if they really count as a brand. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, <laughs> I joined, uh, I, I, you know, the Air Force didn't really interest me. The Navy, I didn't want to be stuck on ships. So it really did come down to the Marine Corps and the Army for me. And realistically, what it came down to is my recruiter sat me down and was like, here's our base in Japan and on the East Coast and the West Coast and Hawaii. You notice how these all have beaches? They're all nice locations. Look at Fort Hood and oklahoma and fort leonard wood and all these terrible places you could end up and yeah. i he, he obviously he left out italy and germany and you know but i was like ooh, yeah i don't want to end up in missouri like i've been there done that <laughs> so 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 you joined and then how far in was it before you discovered like this whole real estate thing oh man i i did every mistake every service member makes right i did the the tattoos, the booze, the cars, the Harley, the guns, the women, the, um, you know, I had no money, um, seven, seven and a half years in and, uh, someone handed me rich dad, poor dad. And it just kind of, the light bulb went off. I was like, Oh, this whole money thing doesn't have to be that hard. Let me learn more about this. And I started reading all of the rich dad, poor dad, like the purple library. And then from there I went into bigger pockets and I just started doing podcasting and, and listening to books and, uh, you know, so I probably had been in like just about seven and a half years when I bought my duplex. Okay. And you like bought it with the intention, like I'm going to house hack this. Yeah. I moved in and I lived in one side, rented the other. And then six months later I got orders to Hawaii and then I moved out when I moved there. And that was kind of what it was the moving out that actually really solidified things for me. Cause I was like, Oh, this works. I am making money on this yeah. property. This is cool. Which wasn't yeah. the case, you know? Uh, when I was living in it, but it was still cheaper to live there than the apartment I'd been in beforehand. Well, let me ask you. So on that first duplex, you know, when you, when you did PCS to Hawaii, did you rent it out to other service members or like who, because it's right next to the base, right? Uh, no, I was, I was a recruiter at the time. There was no, no installation anywhere uh, near us. Um, so I just handed it to a property manager and let it ride. Okay. So you started off with a property manager from the very beginning then do you manage any of your properties yourself now no no i am the worst the last person you want managing any kind of operations i'm feeling like that right now man i like literally this is like the the last two weeks for me have been the worst landlording experience i've ever had since i've been doing this and like i i have only 14 single family homes and then i'm also invest i'm an lp in a, the, some apartment complexes which which is great because oh, yeah. it's just passive right um but on my single family homes i manage them myself and there's years that will go by where everything's just you know rosy right and i haven't had bad tenants i've i mean i had like one bad tenant um yeah my problem is like the environment and you know shit breaking and stuff like that so <laughs> Two or three weeks ago, we had these crazy wind storms. I lost half a roof on one property, fences down, down on other properties. Then literally one week later, a pipe burst, flooded out a basement. So it's like, I'm just like, oh my gosh. And I'm insurance isn't covering everything. So it's just been a rough little patch. But, you know, the other side of that is I've had just a great experience and I've built a lot of equity. So, and I have maintenance you know, reserves for this kind of thing, but it just sucks when you're the one that's getting the call. Right. So that's why yeah. I definitely, you know, value property managers. Absolutely. Um, so how did you go then you went to Hawaii and which that's an expensive market. Did you buy anything there? So it was, 
we we bid on probably five houses and we got outbid on everything and at the time I didn't really understand how you could go over the VA loan and, and how you could only put 25% down on the difference. I thought it was, you know, and my wife was that my then wife was pregnant. And so we just decided to move on base. And I don't necessarily regret that unless I look at like prices now in that specific area, because I would have been buying a house in Kailua for 800 K and it'd be worth 1.5 plus now. So, you know, I'm like, Oh man, that would have been nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there's, you know, you hear the story. I mean, a lot of, you know, rich dad, poor dad, you know, Robert Kiyosaki says it. Lots of investors, real estate investors, Grant Cardone says it like, don't own the house that you live in. Um, unless it's like something creative, like a house hack, because it is a liability, right? At the end of the day. But at the same token, um, you know, Real estate, like the people that aren't investors that aren't buying the home that they live in, they're making a big mistake, I think, because uh, real estate is the biggest wealth builder in America. And, you know, if you you're going to be paying somebody, you're going to be paying rent. So you might as well be paying down your house over 30 years, because if you never invest in real estate and all you have is that house, at least you have that paid off house. Right. But Absolutely. if you're a real estate investor like us it may make sense to rent while you're buying more investment properties. Like, do I really want to sink money into a property that I'm living in or do I want to, you know, secure my future? So there yeah. is a, another side to that. Like my wife and I, you know, when I quit my day job and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this real estate thing. I have enough cash flow to pay all our bills. Um, things were great. Right. But then we looked at this nice, beautiful home that was like, a mile up the mountain and it just was everything we ever wanted. And, you know, uh, we, it was probably a stupid decision, but we doubled our expenses by buying that house. We were, we could have just rented a house in the neighborhood and had that beautiful life and, and everything else. But, you know, you live and learn the house is worth more now. So I am, you know, I am seeing that side of it, but um, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're in an expensive market, it may make sense to spend your money in, you know, other properties that are going to, you know, increase in value and cash flow for you. Yeah, I agree. I think there's there's a time and a place for both, for sure. Yes, absolutely. So you're in Hawaii, you're living on base, and then you're like, okay, so how did you expand your portfolio from there? What was the next step? I mean, it took a while. I, I saved for probably a year and a half. And I was sending letters to people who owned duplexes, absentee, you know, they didn't live in the house in, in my market back in Missouri, because I was just the only market I had a property manager in. And I was like, well, I want to stay there. Um, yeah. I was looking for duplexes. This guy called me and told me he didn't want to sell me his duplex, but he had a 10 unit that he wanted to get rid of. And that was you know way outside my comfort zone, but he was willing to carry uh, 10% back as a, you know, as a, as an owner carry. And the bank was willing to lend 85%. So I was going to get into it for, you know, just under 5%. I actually, I walked into this 10 unit for $10,990 out of pocket. Um, and it, I, I negotiated it down and this, that, and the, I got it for two twelve five. and needed a bunch of work. So, you know, it's in Missouri. It's not a really nice property at the time, um, but it did cash flow a little bit. And then held that thing for four years. And I, I actually flipped it for, I sold it for three forty at the end of that four years. And so, you know, it was the best return I've ever had on basically 11 grand turned into a hundred and, you know, if you count equity and, and everything else probably turned into 150 over four years. So it was pretty sweet, but, um, that was my next one. And that was, that was not a nice property. That was, that was the epitome of, I have time and not money. So I'm going to be putting in the work and dealing with a lot of headaches. And I don't know that I would buy that same property today, <laughs> but at the time it made sense. And then from there, I kind of, I kind of started really trying to finagle buying off market deals. So I started learning how to, I mean, how to wholesale essentially, but more for the marketing aspect. And so I'd want to, you know, I'd wholesale one or two deals and then I would, I would flip one and then maybe I'd hold on to the fourth one or, or however that broke out. And so yeah. over that next two years, we probably did like 60 deals. And I probably bought and held like eight or 10 of them. Um, I guess it was closer to 12 and then I've sold four of them since then. And then, uh, you know, we probably did four flips, probably held 12 and then sold the rest. Um, and then, 
So that was just kind of my trying to trying to roll money into the marketing fund so I could buy more for myself. And that was fun. The only reason I stopped doing that is that it was a time suck. You know, as as my yeah, online platform started to grow, I wanted to spend more time on it and the wholesaling gig was it was paying the bills, but it was taking so much more money to, or so much more time to run and for the amount of money it was bringing in it just didn't didn't make sense. Yeah. So then fast forward, you were in, you were still in as a recruiter at that time? Uh, I stopped recruiting when I moved to Hawaii, but the rest of this, yeah, I was still active duty. I was back to driving trucks for the Marine Corps. How, how long were you in for? I did 13 years. I exited in October of 21. So you, you decided, you know what, I, I'm not going to, uh, you're not going to hit that 20 year mark. You made that decision. That must've been hard, right? That, that security yeah. that you have just with just knowing that you're going to, no matter what happens with real estate, you have that steady paycheck that's coming in housing and all of that. Um, that must've been a really tough decision, huh? Yeah. I went back and forth on it for a long time. Um, you know, everybody in the military is telling you that you should, you should stay right. Like, why would you, why would you stop if you're doing well? And, um, so it's not necessarily the easiest thing to convince yourself to, to quit. Um, at the same time, it wasn't that I didn't like the Marine Corps. Like I, I still loved the Marine Corps. The only reason I was leaving was um, I started feeling more fulfilled in what I was doing outside of the Marine Corps because as I got promoted, I got stuck more and more into a desk job. So had I been able to deploy or go back to running a motor pool or, or you know, working with the Marines on the ground, I probably would have stayed in. I'd probably still be in. Um, but at the time, I was – I was working in a skiff, so I was in a windowless vault with a three-star command, doing thankless work at a really high level, not interacting with any junior Marines. Everybody in my office is retiring or going on to, you know, try to be the commandant of the Marine Corps. And I just, it was just taking a toll. You know, I hadn't shot a rifle in two years. They were like, oh, we can wave your rifle. And I'm like, no, I want to go shoot. Like, I wouldn't have time for you to go shoot. I was like, this is not like... The paperwork side, like all this crap is not why I joined the Marine Corps. And everyone's like, well, yeah, you yeah. do that. You know, that's what happens when you get promoted. Yeah, but this was at a pretty egregious level. Like most units yeah. don't waive your rifle score, you know? Yeah. So then you decided, you know what, I'm just going to get out and I'm going to go all in on, on real estate. Yeah, I went all in on real estate. I went all in on the community. And, you know, so that was... I kind of started doing bigger deals. So I, I, I would say of those 60 deals we did finding off market stuff, probably 25 of them were while I was still in. And the other 35 were that first year I got out. And then that's kind of when I started to shut that down. Cause it was just, it was stressful. It was, it was eating me alive on some of the flips. It was just taking way too much bandwidth. And so I slowed down. I started kind of focusing on bigger deals where I could, I could bring value to the deal without having to be the capital or the time. And so yeah. I would, Either it was either raising money for deals or bringing people together to to make deals happen, and I'd get a small chunk of the equity for helping, but I wasn't having to operate the deal and I wasn't having to fund it myself. I wasn't having to find it, and so I started moving into the bigger scale stuff that way. And then that takes less of my time, but I still get a return. It's just a much long term. It's it's a long term play. So like, I get very little money for the first. We bought a hotel in December. I might make a couple thousand bucks over that first six to seven years and then eight, nine and 10, I'll get a pretty big payout. But my amount of the amount of time I spend on it is effectively one hour a month on a zoom call. Yeah. And plus you probably get some tax advantages from it as well, right? Yeah. I got $80,000 in cost seg right off for this year. So yeah, man. So, so many, so many tricks with real estate. Right. And it almost feels like this is legal. It's like, you can really do this, but it's, <laughs> it's legit, know. you know? And honestly, I was just having a conversation with someone about this. They were trying to tell they're not in real estate, right? And they're trying to tell me that, you know, it's unfair that real estate investors get all these things. I'm like, is it really, though? When you think about it, like we're creating housing, right, for people. And the government's not doing that. So they're giving us an incentive to create housing. So I think that, like, we should be getting those breaks. Because if we're not getting those breaks, why would we be investing in real estate? It would make no sense. We would go invest in something else. Yeah, especially when everybody hates on landlords. It's like you can't have your cake and eat it too. Like you can't say landlords are the worst people in the world and then be jealous. Exactly. 
We all get. I mean, once you have a platform like this podcast, I mean, I, I don't even read the comments anymore on some of the content (laughs) that I put out there because it's just like, okay, don't read the comments ever. And I think that's a that's really good advice. Just keep posting what you're doing, and you know, you're helping a lot of people out. You know, there's a lot of active duty families, right, that are living paycheck to paycheck, and they don't realize that they can tap into this, and they could. They could actually increase their their monthly uh, income through real estate, and then when they get out, they're going to be set. Whether they could stay in for twenty plus, or they get out early, they'll have options. Yeah. So I really, I really do commend you for what you're doing with the military millionaire uh, community and everything else. Definitely helping a lot of people. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun to run. So where do you see yourself in like five years? Like, what's what's your game plan? My big goal right now is to do basically do deals where it doesn't take any of my time. Um, So I'm not the operator with people that I really trust. And then I'd like to focus the energy I'm saving there on development. I want to build something. I've got a couple different ideas, but I'd like to build something really cool here locally. I'd, I'd like to build something where I can tell my son one day, like, Hey, we own that. And he'd be like, wow, that's so cool. Instead of right now where it's like, wow, dad, that's a crack house. Like you're damn right. It is. <laughs> it's one of the few that I didn't sell and don't talk yeah. to the tenants. They might, they might, you know, be smoking a pipe right now. Yeah, um, I, I took my daughter to this old duplex that I had. It was a, yeah, I mean, it was a, a rough area. I don't have it anymore. I got, I 1031 it, but um, like, they were like smoking crack outside when we pulled up and my daughter's like, I'm never investing in real estate. And I'm like, okay, look, <laughs> <laughs> they pay the rent. <laughs> they pay the rent in yeah. cash. And sometimes I have to meet them in a corner somewhere, but I get it. <laughs> so one of my buddies had a, he rented out his place to three ladies and it was a three bedroom house and they moved in and they, everything was, you know, legit. And they turned it into a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> like really? the three ladies were just running tricks out of the, the place got shut down by the police and it was this whole thing. But he's like, I don't know. Their records were clean and they were all paying rent. Like whatever. <laughs> he's like, I they're, didn't know. They're never late. <laughs> so if you look at my portfolio today, I buy rundown properties in decent neighborhoods like class B around military bases. I'm in Colorado Springs. So we have like yeah. the air force Academy. We have Fort Carson, uh, Army base. We ha- we have um, uh, Peterson Space Force. We have Cheyenne Mountain. You know NORAD. Everything's out here. Yeah. Space Command. So lots of military, lots of bases. So what I try to do is I find these rundown properties in the better areas, and then I go in there and I fix them up, and I put military tenants in there. I mean, I'm not I'm not like discriminating against everyone else, but when you're five minutes away from the Army yeah. post, right? Uh, you, that's what you're going to get. Um, it's worked really well. And, uh, 2020, that whole COVID fiasco, I was like, I didn't have any issues because all, most of my tenants are military and they weren't losing their jobs and they kept paying rent. Um, and I also took full advantage of the interest rates dropping because I was able to just instantly refi my entire portfolio to the point where I was like, Oh, I have enough money now where I don't have to work. So it worked yeah. out. That's awesome. But I, I but that. that being said, I I right now I'm like feeling it because I've had a rough couple of weeks as I was telling you earlier. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I really want more passive investments. Like this this uh syndication that I I uh invested in. It's like I'm just like I'm amazed by it. I got this huge tax write off and I'm just getting a check you know, it's automatically deposited in my bank account every month and I'm not doing anything. I, I like that. I agree. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. It is. So your future is looking at trying to get into the development side of things, huh? I think so. I think just being able to build something like that is, you know, pretty rewarding in itself, right? But the fact, like you yeah. said, you can show your kids, hey, look, we own this. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I think it's exciting. I think it's really exciting. You know, I went to Chicago... They did their architecture tour on the boat. And when I got done, I was like, hmm, there were like 10 or 15 guys that built this entire skyline. Why can't I build something like that? I don't know if it'll ever be like that, but 
kind of puts in perspective like man i'm not doing a whole lot i thought i was doing a lot but i'm not doing a whole lot like i'm not yeah. thinking big enough yeah i mean sky is really the limit when it comes to real estate you could put these deals together a lot easier than you would think there's yeah. plenty of investors out there that would love to help you develop something if you had a great if you had a good idea yeah i'm starting to lay that groundwork now locally nice so where wh what do you have right now in your what's your portfolio look like today we've got an rv park uh we just sold two so one apartment complex a hotel uh, that we actually just signed an loi to sell 23 single families two duplexes and then a bunch of you know gp uh investments in so that's got a few apartment complexes and then a 130 unit boutique hotel which is our most recent acquisition and i, I like those i like the boutique hotel model because i'm i'm gonna get to go stay there with my son towards the end of the month for free and show him yeah. like hey this is our place I I, I like that idea too. Like I know Rich Somers is, he's actually going to be on my podcast two weeks from now. And I nice. know that's his, that what he shifted to. And I like that idea because it's like, wow, not only can I travel there, right? Um, I could also, you know, for friends and family, I could say, oh yeah, we'll reserve a room for you. And I just think being able to offer that's pretty powerful. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an interesting space. I mean, especially with everything that's going on with like Airbnb and some cities are cracking down on it. This might be the uh, sweet spot. Yeah. It's all the pros of economies of scale for Airbnb, but none of the regulations. And then, yeah, we give our investors one week a year that they can crash. Oh, do you really? So wait, where is the boutique yeah. hotel at that you own? That one is in, it's a uh, town. It's called Townsend, Tennessee, but it's like. It's two miles outside the Smoky Mountains, but it's not the Gatlinburg entrance. It's like 25 minutes south of that entrance. So how is it like a major rehab? It's we're going to put um, our budgets like three million, but it's not as big as it sounds. It's, it's just because it's a lot of units. So we're going to add a gym. Um, we're revamping the wedding venue and then we've got the hotels in pretty good shape. It's just outdated. Um, you know, the guy was one of those typical, like, basically lived in the hotel. I wouldn't say ran it into the ground, but kind of sucked the CapEx out of it. You know, like, instead of updating things, he would just like, eh, it's not broke. Why fix it? Um, yeah. And so now we're trying to bring it back to back to full life, you know, make it pretty again um, and all of that. But it's it's mostly cosmetic stuff for the rehab. And I think we're going to take out like, it's got a bunch of like legitimate fireplaces and I think we're going to take them out and put in, you know, fancy electric, nice looking ones that aren't a major fire hazard. Yeah. Yeah. Smart. So I know, I know you also wrote the book. Ta -da! The yeah. no BS guide. So tell me about that book. Like when did you write it? I wrote it in, it came out in June of 2021. So my last year on active duty, I was plugging away on this. Um, and uh, basically, it's everything I wish I'd known when I joined the service. You know, I mean, I'm sure things would change now a little bit if I went in there. But for the most part, it's like, you know, it's applicable to young officers. It's applicable to veterans because it's got all kinds of good stuff. You know, a third of the book is all real estate stuff. So that's applicable to anyone. But I wrote it as like a chronological guide to like, if you hand this to a 17 year old before they go to boot camp, Here's everything they should probably pay attention to with choosing a job, allocating their thrift savings plan, how to use that for, you know, gain instead of leaving things in the wrong funds, um, how and when to use your VA loan, whether or not you need to, what kind of life insurance when you get out of the military and why you should not get sucked into buying whole life when you're still in the military and, you know, all those things. Nice. So it's, so, it's something that you can hand somebody right before they go in. Um, and give them the tools that they need to be successful. And it does have a yes. real estate emphasis on it too, right? Building, Absolutely. building real estate. Yeah. 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 About a third yeah. of it came out to be real estate. It's definitely heavy in real estate. Okay. Well, I definitely, I want to get my hands on a few of those that I can give out actually. Cause I, I work with actually my, my daughter, my old, my older daughter is an army recruiter. I should stack her with a stack of oh, those cool. books so she can just give those out <laughs> as people. That's actually a good idea. I gave a bunch to my local recruiting station at one point. Nice. So if you could give advice right now to someone that's active duty, right? They are living maybe in the barracks because they're single or in housing because they have a family. 
and they're interested in investing in real estate, what advice would you give them right now? I would say use the VA loan to house hack. I mean, you buy a fourplex, you live in one unit, rent the others out. You got to pay to live somewhere. So now you're you're cutting your cost of living. You're pocketing the rest of the BAH while you're simultaneously learning how to be a landlord, learning about depreciation, benefiting from you know tax advantages and appreciation and cash flow. And it's a lot less scary to do it that way than it is to say, like, go buy a rental property where, you know, you can talk yourself out of it because rentals and investing is scary. But living in a house is not nearly as scary. So it's like, just go buy a place you live in and that also has additional units and rent those out. And, you know, you can hire a property manager so you don't have to do any of it. But that's my favorite thing. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Um, and how can people find you yeah if they go to the best podcast guest.com it'll pop up a page with a, a free download of the book and then uh, all the social media platforms listed there but uh any other platform really? i'm you, either you, at really 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 oh yeah the, yeah i bought that the domain. best podcast guest that's awesome that's that's creative man <laughs> pretty funny huh i i figured oh, dude, that way I, I, I have to say too i have to i have to I have to stop you for a second too, because I've seen some of your posts recently where you're like <laughs> sitting in front of this nice house and this fancy car and you're like, Hey, buy my book so I can buy more, buy this. And just like look, you little <laughs> funny things. It's just hilarious, dude. I'm all about making fun of the gurus. I, I those guys drive me nuts. So yeah, um, there's a lot of them out there, man. I'll tell you what, there's a yeah. lot of them out there that are making most of their money from their little programs that, aren't really helping anyone but themselves. Yeah, I agree. And uh, yeah, basically any other platform I'm either on as military millionaire or from military to millionaire. Nice. And and how can they get a copy of that book? Uh, if they go to that link, there's a free download for the PDF version. And then if they go to my website and just slash book, it'll pop right up. Yeah, I definitely, I think I want to get like a dozen of them and just uh, I'll give a few to my daughter and just to have on hand. I think it definitely... I wish I had that when I was in because I had no <laughs> clue, right? You and I both for sure. Yeah. And it's funny. I've actually had quite a few people read it and then buy like 10 for their unit, which I thought's really cool. It is. Well, hey, David, um, I really do appreciate you making the time uh, to be on my podcast today. Um, we had a few hiccups there in the beginning with the connection and everything, <laughs> but I think we're ending on a good note. Um, I'm definitely Absolutely. going to keep watching you and, uh, let's keep in touch. Cause you never know. We may be able to partner up and do a deal or something. I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Brother. All right, man. Peace out.